Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing outside of BBC TV Centre in Wood Lane, W12. A tube stops south of the Wormwood Scrubs Massacre. Two streets east of where Reg Christie euthanised his dog. A short walk from Lena Cunningham's drowning. And a little dawdle from the Shepherd's Bush sadist. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Opened in 1960, Television Centre was an all-purpose self-contained television studio, complete with a scenery dock, editing suites, a costumiers, as well as an office where I pretended to work, a basement in which I mostly snoozed, a bar in which I spent a decade getting seriously shit-faced, and all of the staff's favourite person, Manny the Tea Lady. Thank you, darling. It's a place infamous for making some of the world's most iconic television shows, like Doctor Who, Blue Peter, Steptoe and Son, Forty Towers, Quatermass, Blackadder, Monty Python and Top of the Pops. But sadly, it's more synonymous as a place which shielded sex pests, rapists and paedophiles. As well as quite possibly Britain's most pathetic excuse for a wannabe serial killer. In 2001, 55-year-old douchebag Brian Darby was convicted of hatching a sad little plan to slaughter six women across West London in a murder spree to rival his so-called hero, Jack the Ripper. As what this friendless little twat wanted most was fame. Ugh! So tragic. But lacking any skills, any talent, and with a statistically small penis and the brain power to match, this useless little turd unleashed nothing but pain and pity. My name is Michael. I'm your tour guide. And this is Murder Mile. Episode 246. Jack the Shitter. In the pantheon of serial killers, you probably haven't heard of Brian Darby. And for good reason. Born in Leicester in 1946, as another unwanted side effect, of too many amorous parents who bonked to mark the end of the Second World War. Brian Peter Darby should have gone on to live an ordinary life as an unremarkable man in the 32nd worst place to live in Britain. And in many ways, he did. Almost nothing is recorded about his upbringing. He achieved a basic education. There were no known reports of sexual abuse, and he was raised by his mother as a good, God-fearing Protestant Christian who regularly attended church and supported the work of the Salvation Army. As a young boy with dark curly hair, gerbil-like eyes, and an increasingly gormless face, even into his fifties, he still retained a childlike quality which endeared him to others who saw him as no threat. And although he wasn't tall, strong or powerfully built, often coming across as a bit of a loser, it's easy to suggest that he may have been bullied, but who wasn't? So what drove him to want to become a serial killer? From his teens to his early twenties, he drifted between jobs as most people do. As he tried to work out who he was, what he was about, and what to do with his life given the fact that he had no skills or talent. (laughs) Living in Greensward, which was then a pleasant little road sprinkled with a hodgepodge of bungalows, farm buildings and ramshackle sheds in the remote and leafy village of East Goscott in Leicestershire. He was surrounded by fields, woods and even a railway society. 
But what it lacked was excitement. In 1972, with a fascination for crime, a desire to be respected, and to earn a good living as a local bobby, Brian attended Hendon Police College on a 13-week course and he graduated as a probationary constable. Unlike the other young whippersnappers who were just fresh out of school, Brian was already 26. But being baby-faced, he barely looked 16 when he began his shift as a beat officer in the city. The 1970s was a bad time to be a copper as Britain was in chaos. With mass unemployment, strikes, power cuts, race riots, a recession, skyrocketing inflation, and an enforced three-day working week. Therefore, crime was rife, the bins weren't being collected, and the streets stunk of shit, piss, and festering nappies. In Leicestershire, Gartry Prison erupted into riots, Imperial typewriters went on strike. And 24-year-old prostitute Rosina Hilliard, also known as Rosie, was found beside a building site on Spinney Hill Road with extensive head injuries and fractures to her collarbone and spine. Later discovered to have been strangled, she's suspected of being one of the first victims of Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. So the Ripper has kept his chilling promise and struck again. As a beat copper, he may have been called in to cordon off the street or secure the scene before the detectives arrived on many horrific crimes which ravaged the county and kindled his morbid love of all things grisly. Or maybe he saw nothing. As his days could have easily have been spent cooing cats out of trees stopping drunks from whittling, or if he was lucky, collaring a bag snatcher or a knicker sniffer. Across his seven years as a constable, it gave him a sense of power, control, and the respect that comes with a uniform and a badge. But being just a humble bobby, with his duties being as far from the thrills and spells of kicking down doors, roughing up hoodlums, speeding a Ford Capri down the back streets at 50 miles an hour, and maybe being flashed a set of boobies, as seen in the TV series The Sweeney. He developed a fascination for true crime. It's a common pastime which the uninitiated may regard as unhealthy. But it only is when the audience loses their grip on reality forgets that real lives are involved and sidelines the victim's tragedy in place of praising the skills or pitying the past of a pathetic loser's desperate search for fame and attention. Sadly, Brian was the latter. A dull little Herbert who mistakenly thought that he was unique and even remotely interesting because he had a poster of a serial killer on his wall and could reel off a pointless list of who killed who using what, simply because he'd wasted half of his life sitting on his fat lazy ass, watching cheaply made shite on the telly, and trawling through a dirge of ill-informed true crime toss. But it was that that ignited his desire to be famous. As a child, he'd been enthralled by Jack the Ripper, the infamous and possibly fictional case of the East London so-called serial killer, who when you conveniently cherry-picked the scant details, was either a genius or a maniac who, being blessed by his fans with godlike skills, charmed every victim to their deaths, and through his cunning, supposedly outwitted a perfunctory police force at every turn. <gasps> Yawn. As a teenager, he'd have digested the endless tabloid diatribe about the sadistic child murderers Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, whose heinous crimes elevated these two sad and tragic tossers to the height of a celebrity, making them icons of the 60s, 
and even though they had murdered children. As if to twist the knife into their grieving mother's broken hearts even further, they've been immortalized by their fans. And as a bored and frustrated police constable who plotted his beat in Leicester, at every turn across the mid to late 1970s, he'd have seen the sycophantic wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the Yorkshire Ripper as this tragically pathetic little arse candle with no skills, no talent, no charm, no personality and with not a single redeemable feature dominated the British headlines for years having achieved nothing. In Peter Sutcliffe, he saw himself. In Jack the Ripper, he saw his mission. And yet, if he was Ian Brady, what he was missing was his Myra Hindley. Born in 1958 in the West Country suburb of Westbury on Trim, in the city of Bristol, Jeanette White was only 14 years old when 26 year old Brian Darby met her, and some say groomed her. As a vulnerable girl who should have been protected, across the 28 years they spent in their on and off relationship, by her 40s, as an alcoholic, Jeanette was drinking 11 litres of strong cider a day, or so she claimed. Referred to by Brian in a series of sexually explicit and deeply disturbing letters written between the two of them as My Myra Hindley. In the later years, Brian would try and groom his long-term lover or possible confidant Jeanette to pick out the most vulnerable of victims for an orgy of lust and death. Given his warped mind, it's amazing he wasn't caught sooner but across the seven years he spent in the Leicestershire Police Force, Constable Brian Darby was said by Superintendent Norwell to be a reliable, straightforward and efficient officer who would have had a good future in the force. And he would have done had this pathetic little loser not had a perverted weakness. Children. As a well-known, but not particularly well-liked constable, in early June 1979, knowing that his gormless, gerbil-eyed face was too familiar in Leicester, always committing his attacks in neighbourhoods where he was unknown, he travelled 40 miles to Birmingham and a playground in Selly Park. Dressed in civvies, Brian Darby, then aged 34, saw a five-year-old boy sitting alone by the swings. Sidling up beside him, Brian chatted to the defenseless and isolated child. He spoke to him about his favourite toys. He pulled out a bag of sweeties from his pocket. And then, seeing that the boy's distracted parent was smoking a cigarette, several times he forced himself on the youngster kissing him full on the lips. Hearing the child's screams, the other children ran off to tell the boy's father, and having darted across the park, diving over the roundabout and through the swings to lamp this dirty little fucker squarely in the face. Although Brian fled with blood spurting from his busted nose, just one street away he was arrested. On the 22nd of June 1979, at Birmingham Crown Court, Brian Darby was tried for indecently assaulting a five-year-old boy. And in a bafflingly short-sighted twist, Judge Ross described this predator's behaviour as an aberration, stating, Perhaps the best thing to happen to you, to bring you to your senses, was the punch the boy's father gave you. A psychiatric assessment was made, but failed to prove to the authorities that he was a danger to the public, and that, 
owing to the stresses of a demanding job and a home life. It was brushed off as a blip. Kicked out of the police force before any further embarrassment could be reported, as well as any other crimes against children which he may have committed. Having served a short sentence in the prison's non-swing, he moved in with his girlfriend Jeanette in Bristol, who'd taken back this convicted paedophile. From the summer of 1979 to the mid-1980s, being two decades before both CRB checks and the sex offenders register were introduced, once again, he drifted between a smattering of mindless manual jobs in factories and warehouses, which didn't require him to reveal his conviction. And again, he lived an ordinary and unremarkable life as a security guard, as over the decade, he married Jeanette twice. In the late 1980s, with their relationship in a fragmentary state, although Jeanette often lived in Bristol, they also assumed the identity of a happily married couple living in Lavender Hill in North London. Being Christians, they belonged to the Enfield chapter of the Salvation Army, shaking collection tins in the faces of annoyed shoppers to ironically raise money for the most vulnerable. As behind them, an out-of-tune brass band blasted out festive carols. None of their fellow worshippers knew anything about Brian's past. But deep down, his thoughts of a murderous killing spree were forming. In the early 1980s, Having massed his conviction for kitty fiddling, Brian got a job as a fire and safety officer at BBC Television Centre. Core, cool, you're probably thinking. I bet he did cool things like rigging the gunshot which killed Dirty Den in EastEnders, or filling the gunge tanks on Noel's house party, right? No. Brian was one of those boring little men in high vis vests who stalked the long corridors of TV Centre with a clipboard, checking that all of the doors were shut, refilling the fire buckets with sand, and reprimanding any staff members who flicked their ciggy buds into a plant pot. Um, was that an ashtray? <coughs> I think not. But like when he was a constable, as a security officer, who will have overseen the public's access to shows like Jim Will Fix It and Top of the Pops, two hugely popular shows for teens and children, which was presented by some of Britain's vilest sex pests and bead vials. The job itself gave him access to people. Watching the productions also gave him an insight into how TV shows are made, as seeing all the girls, boys and their mums being quizzed by the researchers and ushered into studios by assistants, like willing participants who would do anything for their five minutes of fame. He also saw that this kind of person was trusted. On the long boring nights spent endlessly walking the same dull corridors, he fantasized about stalking, raping, terrorizing, and slaughtering a slew of terrified women across London in a vicious spree so horrifying it would make him as internationally famous as his blood-soaked hero, Jack the Ripper. At night, he dreamed of the fame which awaited him. The book signings, the adoring fans, maybe even being invited to a crappy overpriced crime convention and the endless cheaply made documentaries which would hail him as a crafty, charming master manipulator, with a genius IQ, a foot-long cock, and hair which didn't resemble pubes. All the while, imagining the grisly nickname that the tabloids would give him. Maybe the West London lobotomizer, the Acton annihilator, or the Shepherd's Bush slaughterer. 
but in truth it wouldn't happen. As a more apt title for this gormless twat and gerbil-like tosser would have been Britain's most pathetic loser, the turd who stalked London, or as I shall call him, Jack the Shitter. In 1998, as his girlfriend Jeanette had moved back to Bristol, in an endless stream of perverted verse to the woman he described as my Myra Hindley, in more than 150 letters, over 400 plus pages, Brian wrote about his deep carnal desire to rape, kill, dismember, and cannibalize his victims. As having become obsessed with necrophilia, he dreamed of raping a woman as he killed her. In his letters, Brian wrote, One day soon, we must both kill a girl and we'll be together forever. I need the body of a female to sacrifice and to use her death as our birth. Any race, creed or colour, any female of any age is fair game. Once the sin of murder has been embraced, the age becomes a mere detail. And in a hint to his sick and twisted paedophilia, a little angel is as welcome in my bed as a page three girl. I will take whatever you bring me. And describing the death as erotic torture, even though he had asked her to destroy all of his letters, in an odd and twisted homage, they were later found in her home, bound in a leather binder. By the turn of the new millennium, Brian had begun planning his killing spree. The hunt for victims was simple. Unlike his hero, Brian wouldn't stalk the fog-wreathed streets of London, wearing a cloak, a top hat, and dashing into doorways, letting out an evil laugh. Nope. He used loot. One of the UK's leading free classified ad papers, which in an almost pre-internet world, was a great place to sell cars, clothes, unwanted crap, and as many people did, their homes. And being a physical newspaper, it had to include the seller's name, location, and a phone number. With Jeanette having found each victim, to assess their suitability, Brian called them up. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm a researcher with the BBC. We're doing an investigation into flat sales and finding tenants. And I saw that you're selling your flat in loot. And I wondered if I could have a few minutes of your time. And of course, always wanting to be helpful, each woman was happy to answer his very standard questions. Such as, Are you married? Do you live alone? When would be a good time to come and see you? Questions a TV researcher would ask. And having sent Jeanette to each home to recce the property in advance, Brian the wannabe serial killer had begun to prepare his kit. (laughs) Packed in a rucksack, he stashed what he called his murder and rape kit. Containing an A to Z map, a pack of condoms, a garage made of curtain wire, a set of gloves, a dictaphone to record his victim's dying moments, and as the perfect piece of his disguise, his official BBC identity card, which only contained his name, a matching photo, and the recognisable BBC logo, but with no department nor job title, he could have been anyone. In total, he stalked six women, And each time, he failed. Of the two attacks we know about, on the 4th of October 2000, at the agreed time, Brian knocked on the door of the Westminster flat of Susan Ogre, 
a child mind from a mother of two in her forties. Having opened the door, Susan let in this softly spoken, sweet faced man who held his identity badge up to her eyes. And although he knew that she possibly had a tenant, as he'd already seen her advert in loot, realizing that her well built Polish lodger was sat in the living room, like a coward, Brian made his excuses and fled. As a truly pathetic excuse for a man, let alone a wannabe serial killer, Brian only attacked the most vulnerable of victims, women and children who were alone. And having already failed five times, his sixth victim was chosen with more care. On the 31st of October 2000, Halloween, this rodent-faced tit slunk his way along Windermere Road in Ealing to supposedly interview an unnamed 45-year-old mother of four who at that time of the day was alone in the house with no lodgers, all of her children at school and her husband away. Hi, it's Brian from the BBC. We spoke on the phone. Oh, hi. Come in. Can I get you a tea? Oh, that would be lovely. Thank you very much. And so began the standard pleasantries. For about an hour, he chatted about her home, her life and her house cell, recording it on his dictaphone and stating that if we use you in the documentary, we'll pay you £250, which for anyone is always a nice little bonus. With the interview having gone well, and asking, do you mind if I look around and take a few photographs for the director? Having built up a trust with him, she had no qualms about walking him from room to room. But as they approached the kitchen, it was then that he struck wrapping the white plastic curtain wire around her neck. As she struggled, he squeezed harder. But as a woman who'd given birth four times, who knew what pain was, and who in her own words would say, I wanted to be alive for the sake of my children. With his grip loosening, she pleaded with him, if you don't kill me, I'll give you anything. Money, sex, anything. In his eyes, it was the magic words. A victim who was willing to do anything to please him. And like an idiot, he believed her. And he let go. But as he turned his back on the crying woman lying at his feet, she kicked him hard, ran out of the street, and as she said, screaming like a crazy woman and again being a tragic little cesspit of piss through the back garden Brian fled as Britain's most pathetic loser had failed for a sixth time Brian Darby was suggested as a suspect in the unsolved murders of Elizabeth Chow and Lola Shikoya. Crimes which media-hungry whores like Levi Belfield routinely claim responsibility for. And although the detective who arrested Brian described him as one of the most dangerous men ever arrested and a serial killer in the making, surely it's wrong to give this loser the glory that he so badly craved. In a short but swift investigation, just six weeks after the Ealing attack, detectives traced the call to a phone of the BBC, as well as his fingerprints on a cup of tea, which had been held on the police database since his conviction for assaulting a child, and identifying Brian, who had used his real name and his real identity card. When he was arrested at work, it won't surprise you to learn that he was facing disciplinary action 
for downloading sickening photographs. Try to the Old Bailey on the 21st of December 2001 with Mr. Justice Falk recognising that his girlfriend was under his spell and worshipped him. You were also a willing and an enthusiastic supporter of Darby and all of his vile plans. 43-year-old Jeanette White of Bristol was sentenced to seven years in prison for conspiracy to murder. Found guilty and deemed a risk to the public, 55-year-old Brian Darby was given two sentences for attempted murder and conspiracy to murder, with a further seven years for aggravated burglary. As of today, age 79, if he is still alive, and let's hope that he isn't, Brian Darby, the wannabe serial killer, is stuck inside a prison cell, dreaming that true crime fans are hailing him as a criminal mastermind. When in fact, he was just a twat. So instead of singing the praises of this gerbil-faced turd, rather than giving him fame, if he is to be remembered, let's make sure it's as a pointless little turd known as Jack the Shitter. There we go, folks. Oh, my Lord. Oh, I didn't know whether I was going to record that today. It's pissing down outside. It's on and off pissing down. You and you look at the weather report and they go, oh, it's, oh, it's torrential all day. And then you look at it and go, well, it's not. And then you uh, and then you decide to start recording. I'll take your little hat off. There we go. And then suddenly they go, oh, no, it's raining now. So, it's, so it was raining when I was recording that. And now... Nothing, nothing, not not a jot, not not a diddly squat. Oh, oh, oh for joy. Oh. So I hope you enjoyed that episode. That was one of those ones that I, I one of those ones I wasn't planning to do. But ages ago, I was putting forward an idea to someone about a project, uh, and I stumbled across this this. Uh, an article on this and to be honest there's not much out there it's, it's this is one of those cases that almost doesn't exist you've really got to search for it and there's, there's bits and pieces but there's not much so i basically pieced together what i could it's not based on any police files or court records because they're not available uh so yeah um but I, I just thought it was one of those interesting cases about someone who's just you know a sad little pathetic little loser who loves true crime and he's just like oh i'm gonna be oh, i'm gonna be a big successful jack the ripper type oh and then he just fails massively and i thought what a good way to do it is just to make sure that he doesn't get any kind of respect because that's the worst thing isn't it it's like with some of these assholes that are out there too often in true crime people go oh he was brilliant oh oh he had uh, all this cunning skill he outwitted the police oh and you just go no he didn't no he didn't it's like it's like a lot of the time it's just mistakes a lot of the times do you know the police can't be everywhere they're like oh yes no he out he he escaped from the police if the it, do you know it, 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 it's not like the police were sitting outside his house and then he dodged past them the police were off doing other jobs do you know and then it, I just, I, I just find it really baffling that people do like to praise these kind of assholes. But when you look at it, they're just they half the time they're just lucky. Half the time, no one, no one's really looking out, thinking, "Oh, there's going to be a serial killer walking down this street." Half the time, I mean, that's a lot of half there. Half the time, you know, um, these kind of people blend into society because they are pathetic little people, just just used as people who haven't achieved much. Therefore, no one really thinks that they're going to turn out to be these assholes most of the time these one-off murderers are the kind of people who end up in prison straight away because they're angry all the time whereas the reason these kind of people can kind of blend through society is people think nothing of them but i think i think what's different about him is because he is quite a pathetic little loser a, a jerk off a nothing a wank stain um there's just where they i know the police are on there and they were saying oh he's one of the most dangerous men arrested but think about it it's like who does that really serve does that really serve us or does that really serve the detective because the, does the detective really want everyone to know oh you you arrested a guy who's a jerk off who 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 
out of six women that he stalked, he he basically g- g- wrapped a little bit of cord around one woman's woman's neck and then uh, he let her go. Do you know he's he's all talk, he's all mouth and no trousers. He's all talk. In all these letters, he talks about all the great things he's going to do, and he achieves nothing. So actually, for the detective, it's kind of great to go. Oh, I kill I I arrested a serial killer in the making. But it's like, did you really? Or he said, does that just big you up really? So and and that's the same with the press as well. Do you know? This is why I, I think this case didn't really go anywhere because it's not really that exciting when you when you look at it all in context and it's kind of this uh, this little jerk off. He, he doesn't achieve anything. He's a bit pathetic. He's a bit pointless. You know, it's it's quite sad. So yeah, it's uh, that, and that's probably why it hasn't really got out there. So, but I think it was quite good that um, with with the conviction itself, unlike the first offence where he was caught kissing the little boy. You know, assaulting a five-year-old boy, you'd think he'd get a good amount of time in prison, but he didn't. I think part of it was because he was a policeman. So therefore, it was like, oh, do you know, no prior criminal convictions. He's a good bloke. Uh, as the judge said, oh, it's an aberration, meaning, oh, do you know, oh, it, it, he, he was clearly drunk. He must have, something must have gone wrong in his life. Or, oh, let's hope it doesn't happen again. But clearly... The judge on this case went through all the letters that were stored away and looked looked at all that and looked at what type of person he was and thought, Do you know what, he could be a real liability. So let's lock him away for a long time. And they did. He got, which is interesting, he got two life sentences for attempted murder. So that's interesting, given the fact that quite often when we've covered cases on here and someone has committed an actual murder, an actual premeditated murder, and they get a couple of years in prison, whereas this time this guy was like, yeah, you know, they made they put him away for two life sentences plus seven years for aggravated burglary. So uh, two life sentences. So that will be there will probably be life sentences to be concurrent. Uh, so he's probably twenty years on that, and then seven years on top. So even if he, I don't, I think he's still probably in prison. I, I did look, I did do some searching, but I couldn't couldn't find him anywhere. Uh, problem is he's got you know brian darby brian um it's your quite kind of common name as well so yeah i searched I, I couldn't find a death record so he's probably still alive could still be in prison still a tosser though isn't he still an absolute wank stain on society um oh did i say welcome to extra mile the unscripted unedited bit i don't think i did i should really have done uh so there we go there we go um what else is happening here i'm 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 not going to make a cup of tea only because I'm uh, I'm going to go to a coffee shop in a bit. I'm in a nice swig of water though. Oh, fresh, refreshing water. Lovely. Um, oh, uh, a thank you uh, to Hannah Olsen and uh, Francois Cabrel. I hope I pronounced your names correctly. Uh, with the last episode, uh, I had a little bit of a problem trying to work out how to pronounce a norwegian name it was the ski instructor who was in there and i couldn't work out it it, it was like d-r-n-u-l-f or t i think it was i couldn't work out how to pronounce it and they kind of pointed out that um it could be the the norwegian o with the with the line through it that no one uses anywhere else <laughs> and therefore because this was kind of uh it had been typed on a british machine it looks like they'd the, the detective had used a D in place of it because we had we hadn't got anything on there. So it's, that that was great. That really helped. Even though it was only important to the episode, I like to get things right. I like to kind of get names and details right. So uh, and uh, yeah, otherwise I would have called him Doom. So there we go. Um, thank you to uh, new patron supporters. Thank you to Barry George. I hope it's that's not the Barry George. Uh, Lena James and someone called TFI. So thank you to Barry, thank you Lena and thank you TFI. Uh what else is going on? Um following on from next week's episode which we got uh, last week's episode which was the uh, the one where I put it, uh, one of my many freedom of information requests where I put out for cases to be released and then I can reinvestigate them. There's another one of the same era. 
uh, that hasn't been released yet. And it's um, I'm really hoping that this is this is another unsolved one, another unsolved prostitute in and around the same area in and around 1942. So there's no real reason why they shouldn't release it. But I've just I've just had one of my many emails from them saying, oh, we're still in, looking in this, but we'll let we'll let you know. So I'm hoping that one gets released because that could be that, that one I'm really excited about. But um, we shall see. Anyway, let's do some quiz questions. Uh, and then we'll d- we'll try and dive into as much stuff as we can that's extra into this. But I, there's not a lot, to be honest. I put almost everything in the episode. So let's do some quiz questions. Uh, question number one. What year was BBC Television Centre opened? I know when it was shut. It was shut in 2013 because I was there. I was there... Um, uh, in the bar having fun and i was there when everyone was running around the building fleecing it of all the all the signage literally you've never seen so many people going through the whole of the bbc stealing stuff and security just staring at everyone going i don't know what to do <laughs> uh, uh question number two uh in which city was brian born oh brian question number three what was brian's middle name Question number four, what religion was Brian? Question number five, what was the name he lived on when he was a child? Question number six, where did he do his training as a copper? Come on, Police Constable Arsenal Guinness should be able to get this one. Question number seven, what age was he when he became a police constable? Question number eight, where was Jeanette born? Question number nine, how much older was Brian when he met 14-year-old Jeanette? Pedo, pedo. And question number ten, how many years to the nearest five uh, were they together? So I will, uh, a little note to myself to record some uh, next. Unulf Hoop. That's what I'm going to add into the next one. Was was private Unuf hip. Yeah, big week. Um, so let's. I, I I haven't got much to dive into. Normally with this one, we could, there's normally I have to cherry pick all the details that I can give you an extra one. I don't have a hell of a lot. I literally have put almost everything in there. So uh, I went searching and I found kind of um, the details about the attack on the five year old boy. Uh, it said a constable in the Leicestershire police uh, was passing through an unnamed children's playground. Uh, I managed to work out it was in and near Selly Park. Uh, while on a visit to Birmingham, uh, so that means he, he wasn't in uniform, uh, the boy was sitting down. He kissed him several times. Uh, the other children ran off to tell the boy's father, who came to the scene and hit Darby in the face. Darby then ran off. Uh, it, it was said he was approached the boy in, in a Birmingham playground and began kissing him on the lips. He was arrested not too far away. Uh, 23rd of June 1979, he was found guilty in Birmingham Crown Court uh, uh, of indecently assaulting a boy aged five. He pleaded not guilty. He was remanded on bail while reports were made and he was sentenced on the 17th of July. Uh, he uh, He was... Uh, fined £200 having been found guilty by a majority verdict of assaulting the boy Uh, in other articles it says he served a minor sentence but uh, that minor sentence also could be the fact that um, he was remanded so quite often what will happen is is because it was how long was it it was a couple of days yeah yeah it was just a couple no it was about a month so uh, 22nd of June uh, until the 17th of July, so almost a month. So given the fact that he'd s- spent a month in prison awaiting the trial, uh, it's likely that the judge, being quite lenient on him, had probably said, I'm going to sentence you to a month in prison. Oh, that's convenient. You've already done a month. OK, in that case, I'm just going to charge you 200 quid. Uh, so that's a-, a bit shit, to be honest. A bit shit. Um, the judge said there was no rational explanation for Darby's behaviour and I feel justified in dealing with this matter on the basis uh, that it was some kind of aberration. Judge Ross said perhaps the best thing that could have happened to you in order to bring you to your senses was the punch on the nose your father gave, uh, the boy's father gave you. Uh, in some uh, papers it says that uh, Darby was sacked from the police force. In others it says that he voluntarily resigned. 
um in 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 some of them they also get the the year wrong as well they say it's 1978 not 79 um it is suggested that he was being investigated by the police at that time for indecently assaulting other boys uh but i couldn't find any more about that that seems to be kind of everything that's in there uh although there were as, as we see in here even though he's based in Oh, I can't remember if that's a quiz question. Even though he's based in a certain city, he travels over to Birmingham because he makes sure that he's he commits his crimes never in the neighbourhoods or the areas where he's known, so he's always travelling. Uh, but in and around the same time at the, there, Birmingham Post said, the police are hunting a crazed sex maniac in Birmingham after sadistic attacks, attacks on little girls. As we've seen, he attacks young boys, he attacks young girls. Detectives fear that the prowler who lurks around children's playgrounds may already have struck a dozen times. The latest attack happened near Pershall Road in Selly Park, where a four-year-old girl was out in the sunshine with a seven-year-old boy. They were stopped by a man who gave them 15p uh, and told the boy to go away. He's, he then seriously sexually assaulted the girl. She was bad, badly shocked but not hurt and later give, gave a detailed description of the attacker. Um, interesting. The, the it's, it's a description that it doesn't fully fit um, Brian, but let's not forget that the girl is four years old so you know, trying to get information as, as we, if you go back to the um soho strangler case we don't forget we've got five people who stood next to us next to a murderer talking to him for about half an hour and they they thought his age ranged from early sorry late late 20s until early 50s and you know so she said she thought he was 18 or 19 so that means a lot older than her so it could have been 20s uh, said he enjoyed playing football with the boys in the area. He was about five foot eight inches tall. We don't know what height Brian was, but that's about right. Black, greasy hair. Yep. Bushy eyebrows. Yep. Blue jeans, red shirt, black trainers. Uh, that's all she could really report on that. There were also similar other incidents in the Sturchley area, which is not too far from there as well. Um, the relationship between Brian and Jeanette is kind of a weird one. Uh, she seems to be... Uh, spending a lot of time in her hometown, but also living with him as well. They seem to be on and off all the time. They seem to have been married twice. They seem to separate quite a lot, uh, but they seem to stay in touch. So it's, it, I've tried to be a bit cautious with this one, because even though she was charged with conspiracy to murder, and it, it's there's a lot of weird stuff that's going on. Like, she's keeping the letters. She seems to love him, but there's the whole thing about him picking her up when she was 14 years old we don't really know a lot about her back history so maybe maybe she's being groomed or maybe you know maybe she's as messed up as he is so we just don't know so i've kind of played a bit easy with that not easy but kind of cautious with that one because we don't really know about her background um as mentioned they were in the salvation army in the enfield chapter uh Interestingly, if you look at the Salvation Army, um, founded in 1865 as the East London Christian Mission uh, by one-time Methodist preacher William Booth and his wife Catherine, uh, it can trace its origins to the Blind Beggar Tavern, which is oddly where Ronnie Crane murdered George Cornell. Uh, not that we've ever covered that on the case, because I just can't be asked for that. Um, and it also, it's East London as well. So who cares? Who who cares what happens in East London? Uh, interestingly, he got, he got a job at the BBC in the 1980s. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Given the fact that this is all around the area, era of Jimmy Savile, Stuart Hall, Rolf Harris, Jonathan King, and later assholes like Max Clifford. All paedophiles. All paedophiles and perverts. Well, there we go. Um... So yeah, he he was he was just uh, one of one of many paedophiles and perverts that were being protected. Um, I, I think given the fact that he was, his job when he was there because he was a security guard. Um, this because this I mentioned in this this is the years before CRB checks, which is uh, criminal records bureau checks. That's where they check your criminal record. Um, and uh, being before he he would have been put on the sex offenders register. So. Given the fact that with his job, it's, if you were a researcher on Jim Will Fix It, you would have 
you would have had your background checked because you're dealing with children but because he's just a guy who stands outside going this way this way okay stop there stop there oh why is that window open no close the window put that cigarette out you know they don't really need they really need his kind of criminal record on that so you know um in in that kind of era i remember being interviewed in around that era and it was like if you had a criminal record legally you had to mention it um but you didn't but you know if you didn't ha- if you didn't mention it at the time you just you go oh sorry i made a mistake Do you know unless it's really really important not saying that i did that because uh, i've never had a criminal record you're welcome unlike eva unlike eva i'm not even going to go into <sighs> Jesus Christ! Let's just, let's just be honest. It's, most of it's drunk and disorderly and criminal damage and uh, a shitting in the street as well. She loves doing that. Loves doing that when she's had a big kebab. Um, as mentioned, quite a sad little man who wanted to emulate his hero, Jack the Ripper. He became obsessed with the idea of having sex with dead bodies. I mean, he loved bragging about shit all the effing time. But what did he achieve? Nothing uh what have we got what have we got what have we got what have we got the letters um we've only got fragments of the letters i've kind of used pretty much most of what we got in here um we have his letters to her but we don't have her letters to him which which kind of uh, unbalances the case slightly so even with the case like it was said that she was the one who went through loot and found all of these people and sometimes she would call them up but also she went according to the new this is all coming from newspapers so how much of this we can trust we don't know but according to the newspapers it is said that she visited the victims to assess them in advance before he went to visit them um so and because we don't have his letters that he wrote to her i don't know we don't her letters that she wrote to him because he was saying i want to destroy everything so he destroyed all of her letters but she didn't destroy his letters therefore kind of all of the onus is kind of on him so uh yeah um it's described by this judge as uh, unbelievably disgusting uh, letters containing extreme sexual fantasies involving the most revolting sexual perversion uh including having sex with a woman while killing her um as mentioned uh, more than 150 letters uh, anywhere between 380 and 450 pages uh references to cannibalism uh let's see in the letters darby tells white that's his girlfriend uh it is only after uh we have killed that we will be truly joined uh he described their victim as his wedding present to her saying one day soon we must both kill a girl together and we will be together forever i need a body of a female to sacrifice and to use her death which will be our birth any race creed or color no lower limit any female of any age is fair game he doesn't seem to like boys anymore uh he says uh once the sin of murder has been embraced the age will become a mere detail a little angel is as welcome in my bed as a page three girl if you're not from britain uh back in the i think it stopped in the 2000s but on on the sun oh uh, glorious tabloid newspaper which is always full of facts always full of lots of facts and never lies uh on page three they'd always have a semi-naked lady with her tits out and then a little article next to it that says uh susan 26 uh 34 double d thinks and then uh, opinion and uh, her opinion about politics or something that she knows fuck all about um because that's how they like they like to treat their their uh readers like shit although for the sun apparently the sun uh is aimed at people with a a learning age of seven so there you go i'm not going to say what the learning age of people who read the daily mail is but there we go uh it says he encouraged white his girlfriend to find a victim telling her i will take whatever you bring me and he fantasized about erotic torture uh so that was the way that he he kind of found the she found the victims by going through uh loot as mentioned uh the ladies she found were looking to sell their flats um he would ring them claiming to be a bbc researcher t- you know back in those days i mean who who's going to say you're not um and it was really as simple as that quite simple but then again it was all cocked up because him being a complete asshole uh, always bolstered everything up we don't know about the the first six that so of the six 
women who he stalked, we don't know about the first four. And also we don't know what order these other ones go in. We know, we know that the one with Susan was at the start of the month on, I think it's 4th of October, and the other one was on Halloween. We know that. But the other four we don't know anything about. They weren't reported on. So uh, there we go. I think I'll do the quiz questions. Yeah, I'll do the quiz questions now. Um, and then I'm going to go off and get a quaffy, a, a, a cup of quaffy. Um, so here we go. Question number one. What year was BBC TV Centre opened? That was 1960. Question number two. <sighs> in which city was uh, Brian born in? It was Leicester. 32nd most worst place to live in Great Britain. Uh, <laughs> question number three. Uh, what was his middle name? It was Peter. Question number four, what religion was he, supposedly? Uh, he was a Protestant Christian. Question number five, what was the name of the street he lived on as a child? It was Greens Ward. Question number six, where did he do his training as a copper? Uh, that was at police. Uh, that was at Hendon Police College, which apparently is a good pub nearby, according to Police Constable Arsenal Guinness. And of course, of course he would know that. Uh, question number seven, what age was he when he became a constable? He was 26. Question number eight, where was Jeanette born? Uh, Bristol. Bristol. Question number nine, how much older was Brian when he met 14-year-old Jeanette? Well, he was 26, therefore that's 12 years. Pedo, pedo. Uh, of course, of course, do you know, he, uh, if you're a rock star and you're in your 40s and you happen to be dating a girl under 16, that's fine, isn't it? That's all acceptable. But anyone else, pedo, pedo. Uh, and question number 10, how many years to the nearest five were they together? They were together 28 years. So if you say... Anywhere between 23 and 32, is that? I don't know. Oh, who cares? Who gives a shit? It's just shite, isn't it? I mean, you're not going to win anything. You're not going to get a prize for answering shitty questions. Oh, so there we go. Oh, I'm hungry now. I haven't even got any lunch available. Oh, man. And there we go. It's still not raining. Still not raining. It only rained during that midsection when I was recording that. But that's good. I've got some other stuff to record. Uh, so that's it, folks. Uh, have yourself a good week. Uh, thank you for listening to Murder Mile. I'm not too sure what episode I'm doing next week. It will be a one-parter. Uh, so I hope you enjoy that. Uh, <sighs> time for you. Time for beddy buys, me think. Um, so have a good one. Stay safe and be good. Lots of love. Bye, 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 bye. 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 Bye.